that and it's called Double Green Feet. Green Feet. Double, double Green awesome. Feet. And you can download that on YouTube. Green Feet. Dream. Dream. Yeah, Double Dream. I think I said green as a guy had on a green shirt. And you can, they also have Double Dream Hands. So if you didn't like, if you want to get the hands involved, you can get the hands involved as well too. So, good morning and welcome to Graduation Day. Congratulations. Like I would we, say you've made it to the end, but the work is only beginning. Looks like we weeded out the group, too, so. We have a, a smaller group today, but we're going to be um, large in spirit. So if you would, um, bow with me for prayer. God of grace and glory, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for the sun that shines in our lives, um, both outside providing the heat, but most of all for your Son, Jesus Christ, that shines in our life. Let His presence be felt today as we worship you and as we grow in our ministry and our relationship with you and each other. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning. Good morning, teacher. We, um, are going to have a little lesson today about some mission work and some different things. So we're going to talk real quick this morning about uh, William Carey. Has anybody ever heard that name? All right, Abe Tan goes that I, I love mission work, and uh, William Carey is often called the father of modern missions. He was a shoe cobbler, um, and he worked on shoes, um, and then he went on to um, start lots of mission work. And before he did, he was working at his shoe place, and he was working, and he was working on shoes, but every, every so often, he would take a break, and he would go over, and he had a map of India. And he would go to his map of India, and he would just stop, and he would pray. And he would stop and pray, because that's where the God, that's where God was leading him, was to India to do missions. But he would work and he'd work and every so often he'd go over and he'd pray over his map. And then one day a friend of his came and was watching him work and he said to him, he said, William, what are you doing? Why are you neglecting your work? You have all these shoes lined up and you're going over there and you're praying. You have customers that are going to be mad. And then Carrie said to him, neglecting my business. My business is to extend the kingdom of God. I'm only a cobble of shoes to pay expenses. And that's kind of like us. We all have different jobs in life. Some of us are youth pastors. Some of us are pastors. Some of us have outside work that we do. Some of us are homemakers. But our real job that God calls us to do is to grow the kingdom of God. So today I want to read to you 1 Timothy 4, 11 through 16. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching, and do not neglect your gift which was given to you through the prophecy when the body of the elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Preserve in them because if you do, you will, both, you will save both yourself and your hearers. I wanted to read this scripture to you today because this room is filled with Wonderful people that have made a choice to actively work toward extending the kingdom of God. We have seen that over our weeks together and our time together of studying and, and reaching out to our churches and looking at ministry in new ways. You have seen the need, you felt the call, and you've put yourself in action. And for that I say, well done, faithful servants. But now I want to remind you of Acts 20:28. 20, Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. 
Let's break this verse up backwards. I like to stir things up sometimes and look at things backwards. With us still in the Easter season, it's readily on our minds that Jesus gave his whole life for the church. He is our shepherd and he taught us to be shepherds by using his example. So to be shepherds of the church of God, which he brought his own blood, is fairly simple for us. We've studied it, we practice it, and we do it. The Holy Spirit, let's look at the next verse. And all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. The Holy Spirit has called you into ministry with people that you are in relationship with in your children's ministry, your youth ministry, your church, and your community. Keep watch over them by protecting them and teaching them. Pray for them daily. Keep watch on them by helping develop their relationship with God. Keeping Jesus in the center of everything you do. A ministry without Jesus is a club. The love and relationship with Jesus is what makes it a ministry. Now lastly, let's look at the very first part of this. Keep watch over yourselves. In our busy world, this one is hard. Self-care, both physically and spiritually, are important to maintain. If you are tired and exhausted, you cannot be the best of you. As parents, grandparents, and spouses, we all want our significant others and our children or grandchildren to take care of themselves, but we forget to do the same for ourselves. Take time for the checkups. Take the balcony time and rest your body, mind, and soul. Watch over yourself. Feed yourself with opportunities of spiritual renewal and growth. You cannot feed into others if you are not being fed into. God loves you. Did you hear that? God loves you. And if I was to ask you, when was the last time you did something for someone else, you could probably immediately tell me. But if I said, God knows you by name, you are his child, when was the last time you did something for you, his child, you'd be less likely to answer that question so fast. God loves you, and he wants you to take care of yourself as much as you take care of anyone else. He wants you to be in relationship with him and each other to do ministry. Remember that Jesus Christ himself did not do ministry alone. He sought after a sustainable ministry, a ministry that will continue long after he was on the cross. Today may be the last day of our on-site training, but please know that the Next Gen Ministry team and partners are always on your team. The work doesn't stop today. God continues to press us on to do our work to take care of each other and ourselves. Keep watch over yourself and all the flock by which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he brought with his own blood. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity to be your shepherds. We thank you for sending Jesus Christ, your son, to lead the way. We ask for strength during the difficult times, and we ask for celebrations during the joyful times of our ministry. And most importantly, we ask for your presence to be felt in this room today. We thank you for our many blessings, and we ask that we would bless each other in our time together today, and that we would walk out these doors and continue to do the work of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I gotta say, I want to thank Chandra for that. that was, um, I've known Chandra for I don't know how many years, and every time I have the opportunity to interact with her, uh, I am just blown away by 
her willingness to lean in and who God had created her to be from the beginning and she's just been discovering it more and more uh, every day, right? And I think that's what we should be about in our ministry for ourselves, but also for those students that um, are in our ministries. And so um, so here, I just want to give you a, uh, a first thanks for, for being here. Um, you all have received, you'll be receiving your doctorate today. Um, in a smaller church ministry. It may not say that on your certificate, but but it is a doctorate. Um, and so, so I just wanted to just say thank you for that. And then also, um, we are going to, um, I'll be sending you a doodle poll to have to set up a call with me. And, and in that call, what I want you to, I'll ask you some questions and and, uh, but I want, it's, it's not me coaching you at that point, it's you coaching me. Um, you giving me feedback about your experience uh, in the cohort. Uh, how can we make this better for you, how, for you and for others? What can we do for you moving forward um, beyond, beyond this training day, beyond this cohort? How can we continue to, as, as uh, uh, Chandra said, be a part of your team? Um, and there are a lot of changes and a lot of exciting things that are happening at the conference level and in the districts, and we want to continue to build. And don't be surprised if we start calling on you uh, in the weeks and months to come to become leaders in your district, uh, because you have more knowledge now than some others in your districts do about how to be in ministry with young people, how to be in ministry with in, in smaller settings. And uh, we're looking for people who are willing to talk to others and uh, help be collaborative, help be connectional, help be resources and points of contact for folks so that nobody feels like they're on a team of one, right? That there's always somebody that they can connect to. Um, and don't underestimate the knowledge that you have inside you. I think one t I heard a young man say the other day that uh, some, somebody asked him, uh, who influences you? And he was able to say that. And then he said, uh, then they said, well, who are you influencing? And he said, wow, I don't think I'm influencing anybody because I don't know enough yet to be able to do that. Um, and that's not true, okay? The moment that we begin interacting with another, we begin influencing the other. And so you have more knowledge inside you, uh, to use a biblical term, you have more power inside you that's waiting to be un unleashed and the crazy thing was, as I was driving through the parking lot, there was a white dove in the parking lot. The Holy Spirit is here in the parking lot. I thought that's the first thing that popped my head. It's like, there's a white dove in Smyrna First parking lot. So, so anyway, don't, don't, ruin, don't ruin the metaphor of the Holy Spirit in the parking lot. Okay? But the reality is, um, you have more power than we give ourselves credit for. You have more ability to influence uh, each other and young people and parents and uh, your community than we give ourselves credit for. And, um, and that's what young people of all ages, whether they're uh, just born or whether they're 99 or whatever, they're all young people on the side of God, and they all need your encouragement, and they all need your influence. And so I just want to say thank you for Stephanie to join us back again today. Um, she, went, she went on a cruise while she was gone, and that's why she couldn't be with us. It's called, what was that? It was called Cruise Morphine. That's right. She was on a morphine cruise. So. Two months, or January or February, if I talk to you during that time, <laughs> That's right. Oh, I remember. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so anyway, so come on up. We, okay, I had a question for you. Yes, me. Yes. You said a doodle um, poll to talk to people. Do you have one for coaching call? Yes. Also, yes. Today? Yes, and so my call won't be until after your final coaching call. So we need to get those set, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, and then mine will be later on. So, okay. Great. Any other questions? No? All right, my friends. So here's, here is the um, update now, to kind of just play off of what Chandra 
so beautifully said this morning. The funny thing is, is if you don't practice self-care, it will all catch up with you anyway. So, um, and then, as I am speaking from experience, I, um, and then God uses it to your best. So, um, someone today asked me, how am I feeling? And what I will say now is, now that I'm on the other, the better side of it, I realized that I was sicker for longer than I knew. I was probably sick most of 2017 and ignored a lot of signs. And then, without me going into all of the details, let's just th say things perforated that shouldn't have perforated in this general area. And so, um, Christmas Day, I started feeling really poorly. Um, but I had been real distracted by the flood, you know, the, the, you know, and the dealing with all of that. And the good news about that is, is all of the reconstruction in Casa Caro is done, and everybody's moved back home and living where they're supposed to be. So that's awesome. We have furniture. But I had started losing weight since the flood, because it's, you know, that's easy to do when you don't currently own a stove or a refrigerator and all of that. And then I got sick Christmas Day, and I was feeling real bad. And, and I want to thank God, no matter what you think about, this is not a political conversation, I am still very grateful to President Obama and that administration because I have health care. And because I'm, you know, self-employed, so I have health care that costs me an, an exorbitant amount a month, uh, a month with a huge deductible, and I thought I'd have to get decapitated to ever use this deductible. Well, God said, I will show you. <laughs> so, so by January 2nd, I was going, I think I may actually have to, you know, see somebody about this. I had met my deductible by January 3rd. So, um, I was telling somebody else. So I was in uh, the hospital most of January, and, and there was a little, uh, there was parts of me sort of just taken. And so I, I'm going to be very transparent. This is hard for me to say. I'm going to be transparent because I generally, uh, just because I know that it's good to be transparent in, in self-care. Um, at, at the flood, I was 317 pounds at the surgery, I went in at 292, um, and now I'm at 242. Yay, so, I mean, that's a good thing. And so I didn't realize till today, till he showed that ridiculous video, I actually did all of that. I did it very poorly. And I will not be winning with Dan on Dancing with the Stars. But I just was doing that. I was going, holy, gee whiz. Um, it's amazing what happens when you take 50 pounds off your knees. So, um, so self-care is important. It is not easy because it's boring. I think self-care sometimes is boring. I think that's why I don't do it. If there were like prizes involved, I would do it. But so like, um, so again, in the interest of transparency, I had a mammogram Thursday and the results were back and so there's nothing wrong. And um, I'm having a colonoscopy next week, and no, I don't want the pictures because that's just stupid. And I'm getting a well woman exam, and I'm take I'm doing all those things that had I been doing them, I wouldn't have gotten to where I got to. But again, what the thing is is practice self care before God practices it for you. But I will tell you this: even when you screw up and you don't. Romans 8.28 promises that God works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So, Steve and I, other than, you know, what I'm supposed to say, uh, you know, getting married and the birth of our children as the best days of our lives. Um, uh, three of the best days of my life, especially my call to ministry, was the day I got a butt whooping, so to speak, at a church I served in the Florida Conference, Dunedin First. Um, and then I stayed and served there three and a half more years, which we ought to analyze that one day. Um, and then the second and third best days of my life were the day of our August 28th, the day that our house flooded, and then, and then this whole surgery thing. Because I had the best moments with God during all of this. You know, and, and, and my husband, oh, and, and then I'm going to get off of this. I promise you. Um, but, I mean, like, the coolest thing is, is Jesus does show up in your hospital room. He really, and if you, you, you I, I know you're thinking, maybe it was the morphine, 
Because I did get low jack to my hospital bed, and I said, why are all the rails up and the alarm and everything on? They said, um, Miss Carol, you have been hallucinating. I said, oh, really? And they said, yes, you started telling us how you and Jesus were going to Hawaii. I said, uh, yeah. They said, well, we thought that was probably hallucinating. I thought, you just don't know me very well. But um, So anyway, so one night, I will end with this. Um, Jesus just does show up. My husband, you know, is sick with a long-term degenerative. But my husband stepped up, and it gave him a purpose, I think, while I was sick. Because he had to take care of me because I couldn't take care of myself. And um, so there, he, there's this little old man, my husband, sitting in the hospital room in the, in the middle of the night. And a song that had that we had played at our wedding came through my mind, and I must have been uh, awake enough to pull it up on YouTube on my phone. And there, in the middle of the night, like two two thirty, we listened to the song, Stephen Curtis Chapman song, "Love and Learn," way back from this decade called the nineteen nineties. You've never heard of it. Um, and so we listened to this song, and there, in the middle of the night, my husband and I in the presence of Jesus, felt as if our vows had been renewed. We felt like standing in the place of vow renewal, renewal was Jesus Christ himself. And, and, I, and we didn't, I don't, I don't think we said the words, but I think we kind of did because of that song that, um, and it says, um, I, I, um, through the flood and through the flame is one of the lines in that song. And it, it's just so, God showed up. I am better. Um, thank you for the reminder about self-care. If you haven't gotten all the testing you're supposed to get, just go do it because you're going to get it eventually. You might as well do it on your terms instead of somebody else's, your body's terms under sickness because it's even more invasive than just let me tell you. Okay. So what's that? Yeah, yeah, right. All right, my friends, um, so what are we going to talk about today? Today, um, we're going to uh, kick around some Christian formation concepts, and this is the session that I think I leave you with more questions than answers. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today is stuff that I'm just going to be asking you to talk through with your team or to to talk through whether your team is here today or or, el or just even you know whoever you're sitting at the table with um, but there are things in our churches about Christian formation path that we need to struggle through based on what's happening today um, because I don't know if you've noticed but did any of you all that are older than a minute do you remember the good old days when it was the way it was intended to be when there was the early service at 8.15, then you had Sunday school at 9.30, and then you had the second service at 11 o'clock. Or if you're a smaller church, you had Sunday school at 9.15, and then you had the second service at 10.30 or whatever. Or Sunday school at 9.30 and the, second, and the only service at 11. But everybody went to Sunday school and everybody went to church. Amen. And it was the dedicated Sunday school hour. Remember those good days and some of you still have that? Well, for most of us, those good days are gone, and the Sunday morning question is a conundrum because nobody worships in the, like, like we used to, and, and how millennials participate in the Sunday morning schedule is completely different. If, um, you, want, if you want to read a, wow, that was whatever, that was, was that was, that was awesome. Um, if you want to read a, an amazing book that will teach us what this is like, read Todd Bolsinger's, I think is his name, Canoeing the Mountains. Oh, it's, it's based on the Lewis Clark expedition. And, you know, they carried the canoes on their back because they, they were certain once they got to the mountain range, which was the Rocky Mountains, that on the other side they were going to see the Pacific Ocean. And so their whole point was to find a clear pathway from east to west. Well, they got to the Rocky Mountains and had to ditch the canoes because they were in completely uncharted waters. And the, and the Pacific Ocean didn't come for like another six months, 12 months of exploring. So all of that for us is, is in the church today, it's other th the only thing that has stayed the same is Jesus Christ. Because everything else is uncharted waters where we're at today in 2008. It is 2018. It wasn't that long of a morphine thought, was it? Okay. 
So everything is different, and especially in our Christian formation paths. Because and some of you may be thinking, I don't even know if we have a Christian formation path. So we're going to talk about it. Um, but what I would love for you to do is to just to spend some time, and you can do it with the people at your table. They all look like reasonably intelligent folks. Well, Mandy's sitting by herself, so. Oh, there you go. It's, otherwise, she's just going to talk to herself. Um, I, w I would love for you to spend five, six minutes or so talking about these small group questions. There's just three of them. So um, take some time, talk with each other, be ready for some large group feedback from what you came up with. Uh, everybody got it? Ready, go.
summer. Oh, well, 
I just think, you know, first of all, confirmation can be, is one of the greatest things we do as a denomination. And uh, later on when we talk about rites of passage, we'll talk about maybe brainstorm some ways because um, when we do confirmation, I think the best benefit of confirmation can be for the entire church when we open up and give church members of some ways to be a part of confirmation. Because really all it does is reaffirm our baptismal vows and it reaffirms our confirmation vows. And so we need to provide uh, confidence, um, actual hands-on ways to participate yeah, other than us. Yes, I love it. I love it. Um, love, love, love. Okay, what else? So you got five, that's amazing. That's going to be such a, are you doing it on Pentecost? Um, well, that's okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, the birth of the church or whatever. Just a couple more weeks later, but, you know. Because that's, I, you know, it's like also, but that's also, because May is such a big number, because everybody's trying to squeeze in um, confirmation, um, except for next year, if you're a Pentecost church, because Pentecost won't be till June, because Easter's so darn late next year. But May is like confirmation, and it's Mother's Day, and huge <laughs> I mean, nobody gives a red behind about Father's Day. <laughs> but uh, Mother's Day, you just don't mess with, and we only pretend to celebrate Father's Day just because it's such a you know that Mother's Day is the third largest attended Sunday in a church's? No. Yeah. The first largest attended Sunday is um, actually the Sunday before Christmas. Second is Easter Sunday. It used to be reversed, and it may be still reversed. Um, Easter Sunday's losing a little traction among millennials, but Christmas still gets it because even millennials still tie church to the feel good of Christmas. So, so first and second Sundays are Easter and or the Sunday before um, Christmas. Then the third largest is Mother's Day. The three least attended Sundays is the Sunday after Christmas, otherwise known as that's the Sunday you pastor preaches. <laughs> and the second Sunday is the Sunday after Easter, otherwise known as the other Sunday that you pastor gives to preach. And then the third slowest is, the, is Father's Day. And then the fourth lowest in attendance is usually Fourth of July weekend, and I don't even know why I know that, and I'm sorry. Because now, Do you in those well, no, because nobody else is going. Yeah. I think that you can fight the battle of some of that. Um, the smartest thing I've ever seen. I don't think you can fight the Sunday after Christmas. I just think we all need a break then, and you know, I've even well, anyway, that's not true. Sure, but. Um, I think the Sunday after Easter is the greatest time to do some kind of youth and children's thing. You know, let them do a play or cantata or skit or sing or something. Um, because we, we, those of us that come still have that Easter joy, and when you come and then, then, then it's a Sunday, it's kind of a bummer. Um, Father's Day, we, we, the last church I served were um, uh, in St. James and uh, St. Peter area. Father's Day, we would just give it a Zoom just to sort of fight that battle. So, like, we served, one year we, we, drug, we drug in recliners from everybody's house and just put the recliners all across the front of the church or around the chancel area and served them breakfast. It's kind of like going to you know, drive in church, sort of, you know, serving the dads, you know. That was a crazy, ridiculous congregation, so we would try anything. Some of you get fired up with that. But some of your churches need to get fired up. Uh, anyway. What else? What else has been going great since the cohort began? And what would you attribute that to? Getting more people involved has created 
created more stability. What else? For us, it's been uh, organization. What? Systems? What? Well, first of all, like at this table, those four, especially those three women, they're already doing amazing things in ministry. I've never met three women that's got that have more instinctual um, gift for children's and youth ministry. This kind of comes to them naturally. But you all have just actually even listened and taken some of the things and got more of them. That is true. In fact, I think that that's one of the things that we often say, well, that's the biggest challenge we have, and I think it's actually the biggest, greatest challenge we have, is we are forced as United Methodists to create sustainable systems, because if you've got it all based around the one guy or the one girl who happens to be ordained, you know, and, and is your pastor, then you are always just going to um, ebb and flow and ebb and flow. But if you get solid systems that are in place, and your pastor is just an added benefit to that, then you won't have that. Um, the biggest mistake we can make at about this time of year is to, is to keep on saying, well, let's just wait till the new person gets here and decide. I really think um, about the only decision your new pastor ought to have to make when they get here is read or rule. And I mean the, what they're going to pay his or her office. Um, because uh, is, is your office really removed? Or she, yeah. she said, we don't have an office, which is true. true. <laughs> yeah. To my dining room, of course. I said, I, I love it. You know, so, um, okay. Um, if you, let's, let's jump to the third question. What do you think is the, still the biggest stumbling block y'all are dealing with in your ministry? Maybe it's, maybe it's not been a continuous stumbling block, but what's one of the challenges that you just keep bumping up against now in the children and youth ministry? Deborah? Getting the youth and their congregation to realize they're both in the same church. What the what? <laughs> 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 Sort of 
flows in our schedule. If we should have school here through Easter, and then should we have a post Easter to the end of the school year, and then a summer? Because I'm noticing more and more families and more and more children and students check out of church programming after Easter. Used to be that we'd start our committees, etc., and things up beginning of the school year and we'd end at the end of the school year. But I'm finding even adults and committees and teams just already just since Easter were tired, it's done, it's over. And then we were talking about how um, in May, you know, there's concerts, graduation, there's end of the year ball games, there's district championships. And so uh, Trevor was talking about reading um, Dr. Andrew Zersky's book, and he, he is on the team of Center for Youth Ministry Training, and one of the smartest, ridiculous people I know. It's not that smart, but he's pretty ridiculous. Um, and I would say that to his face. Anyway, um, he was talking about how in May, or this post-Easter thing, we still are expecting our kids to come to us, but what if we switched it up for the last six weeks and we just built our program around going to death? What if we put all of the co choir concerts, the prom, and we'll talk about the prom ideas, what if we put that on our youth calendar and we spent a lot of time going out there? Wow. First of all, it would just give us all a change of pace. And it would, um, what do you think about that? Crazy? Yeah, it's a little crazy. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, but let's review. Um, remember from day one, we talked about average size of the church is 76, even though average worship attendance is 184. I just had on a coaching call yesterday with the church from the Dakota's conference say, I still don't get what that number is. Those first two, it means that the average size membership is 76 people in um, our country in mainline denominations. Any church basically that reports to the National Council on Church of Churches, because that's where the stats come from. But in America, there are a ton of churches who don't do church membership, and that's why that average worship number is higher. Because in like Houston, you've got Joel Osteen's church. You know, well they don't count attendance; they don't really do membership. So that's where that number gets higher than the average. Um, this, this, this one lady says, I just feel like that didn't apply to our church, any of the stuff you're talking about. And she said, and then the other person in the line said, well, you know, the, the first number does. And I said, well, that's really all this is geared towards. This is all geared towards the fact that if, you've, if you're a smaller church and you're around 76 people or maybe even a little more in membership, then that means you're among the 50% higher. And so let's stop using us being smaller as an excuse for why we don't do things, or that makes us less than. Average size youth group is eight students. Average size children's ministry from birth through fifth grade is uh, only 12. So if your numbers sort of land in there, then, then you're just like everybody else. You're, you're a group through average. Uh, today's volunteers, we talked a little bit about that. They're volunteering, they're smart. They are still volunteering in the middle of the world. They're just not volunteering at the church as much because A, we're not asking them soon enough, we're not asking them specific enough, and we're often still using antiquated methods of communicating with them. So, especially today's younger volunteers want what want to know what they want to know when they want to do it. Where in the corners we talk about data management, attendance tracking. I'm convinced that some of you that talk about being more organized or having better numbers is because you're actually paying attention to who's coming and who's not. We think we'll remember. We remember the kids we know better. It's the kids we don't know better that are only coming maybe once a month or once every couple of months. Those are the ones that we forget uh, easily and we're not tracking and following up with. I am convinced that system systemically, if all you did in an organized system was attendance tracking with a solid first time, first time, second time, third time, guest follow-up plan, and a missing in action plan, 
your numbers would grow just by adding that one system. If you actually knew when Johnny dropped out and found out why. But we say, well, we remember and we follow up and we'll send the text. But without looking at a list, we forget kids. We still. Okay? Um, and documents, templates for all of those are, that was from day two, those are all in our file. But today we're going to talk about like um, Christian formation, uh, otherwise known as a discipleship path, otherwise known as a scope and sequence, and any, any teachers in the room. It's basically this. What do we want our children and youth to know about their faith, feel with their faith, and do with their faith? Especially come grad Sunday when those one, two, three, four kids, whatever, however many seniors you have, and you, they stand up front on graduation Sunday in the sanctuary, and you honor them. At what, at what do you want them to leave the, the main arms of our children and youth ministry, Christian education, um, knowing and doing and feeling with their faith. But first, I'm going to play for you a video. Oh, about a Bible story that maybe we don't always include. This is a lesser known Bible study, but still one that's kind of fun. Thank you. 
Yeah. God wouldn't have been mad if they kept a portion and said, hey, we kept a little bit for ourselves and here's the rest. Well, you know what? Because it seemed like it was a big old bag of money. Um, anyway, um, so that's an interesting story that doesn't often go in our scope and sequence of stories <laughs> we teach or preach on. But like I said, it could be a good... Uh, could be a good stewardship Sunday. In fact, there's three videos in that series that I show. I showed you the volunteer one at the first day we were together. Then there's this one. And there's a third one where the disciples all get together. And Luke, which he wasn't really one of the disciples, so it's a little, um, dis he, you know, he was impossible, but he possibly wasn't one of the original 12. But he was he? No. And, right? Yeah. So anyway, in the scene, they're all sitting around, and he pulls out an old think pad, you know, to take notes on. It's just kind of funny. And it's how they created the first service. So you actually, I think now I think about it, can probably show one each of three Sundays at stewardship time based on time, talent, treasure. Um, just, I, I don't know. So, uh, and so you look under... Um, I can't remember who made those now. I got them off the sermon spice, but... This group? Yeah, I'll look. It's Just look up the video of Disciples Draft, and then that'll show you who made it. It's like student song. Student life. I can't remember. Um, okay, so here's what I want you to do. To kind of give us a little experiential example of what may be currently happening with your Christian education discipleship pathway. I'd like you to find a, in just a minute, I'm going to say go. I want you to find a partner. You're going to, you and your partner are going to stand up. Just find somebody at your own at a different table. Just somebody you're not sitting with, somebody you don't know that well. Find yourself a partner, and then the partnership, spread yourselves out around the room. Okay? Everybody got it? Ready, set, break. <laughs>
slash discipleship path planning. How is this exercise like or unlike how we plan for Christian education? I, I, I made an observation too. I, I think I identified Trevor's voice fairly quickly, but I also try to strain to listen to other shepherds to make sure that I was following the voice that I should, to make sure I wasn't just going with so you thought through, is this my shepherd? my shepherd? And I need to drown out those other ones. Right. Because I was hearing his voice, but I thought, because I had, before we closed our eyes, I saw him over there, and I thought, well. I know, I'm tricky that way. Well, then I thought it wouldn't be that close. I assumed that the shepherd would be farther away. So when I was listening to his voice, I thought, well, that can't be. So I'm trying to listen to other shepherds, and I'm going, oh, I'm really... Yeah. And then I had to just blindly trust that that was exactly uh, what I was doing. And so when I got there, I was really, I was so happy. I felt my like, yeah, right, right. <laughs> so I thought, well, that could be a metaphor too, right? That we, we don't need to be fearful of how the world perceives theology, that we need to just be uh, not like, oh, I shouldn't expose my kids to, they're being exposed to everything. Yep. But they we just sure say, here's the, here's the voice that we would you know, we, we have found works for us. We have to, we as adults have had to listen to other voices but go, no, you know, here's the shepherd. Yes. You know, I think those of us that were in school in the 90s or earlier, we missed out. I, I've never thought this. I don't even know if this is true. Um, but, but I have a feeling those educated in the 2000s and later, later know more about world religion and what's happening in Islam and other world religions than we did because back when we, you know, it was when, before we were a post-Christian society, um, we were too afraid to talk about it real deeply in educational settings. Um, Deborah and then Julie. I kind of simple my way of looking at things. I like to look at things. And to me, the way that everyone started out tentatively and shaking. They're not really sure of it had. But the fact that they were still moving. Yeah. yeah. And it's awesome. Reaching yeah. Their shepherd. Good point. Real good point. Julie. Uh, piggybacking on what Tom was saying was that like all those voices that are coming at you, it doesn't even have to be a really loud voice. It can be that soft, gentle voice. What she had, which is not what I was talking it's still a small voice. Small voice is still just as powerful. We don't have to be afraid of that type of church office. We don't need the, the storm and the wind. And no, they don't. That, that general, um, that caring, caring voice Trevor, thank you, Julie. I think one thing I got is the voice is closer than what we may expect. The voice uh, is closer. Mm -hmm. well, oh, great. Yes, hey. Uh, my interpretation is we know where God is. But we're just so worried about bumping other people, it takes us longer. You know, what a, I, I think that is so true. And what I also find in many churches, I'm not sure that this is yours, but it's a lot of churches. We're doing it in Christian education. We're doing a discipleship path. The missing piece is that we never seem to have the conversation of what the intentional path is. We're doing a little bit hit or miss. Um, we're probably saying, hey, we got a three-year scope and sequence in our Sunday school curriculum. It's probably good enough. It's lectionary based. So we know that if they come in at birth and they graduate as high school kids, they're going to get it all. Um, which was true for the most part. But now it's no longer true. And what churches are finding is they got students, they got They've got middle school and high school students for less time, and we've got we're graduating high school students who could not tell you what Noah's Ark story is. Christine, and then we'll move on. Uh, what I what connected with me the most, and what I was because Mark was the last one to get here, was when he got caught up on this corner of this table. It was more <coughs> instinctively that we want to go and get them and bring them to where they need to be. Versus letting them navigate the journey. And I feel like sometimes in our ministry, that's what we do. We want you here, Mark, so we're wasting your time being bumped up against that table. And we pick them up and we move them. Instead of continue to be persistent in 
letting them take their own steps. Let them get there when they get there. Because he actually had the, albeit minute, but didn't you feel a little bit better about yourself? When you, you finally, if we had interrupted you, we would have kind of, you wouldn't have had a chance to succeed at it. Now, maybe, you know, you might not have gone off and been too depressed over that, but, um, but, um, but we let you succeed. You, well, that's true. That's true. Okay, go ahead and sit down. Uh, good job, everybody. Good discussion. So what we're talking about today, and by the way, in case your bladder needs to know, in fact, uh, we lost half the women, so let's take a five-minute bathroom break. Okay, everybody go um, do take a five-minute bath. Clarification question for what she asked. Okay. You said, so repeat what you asked. Well, what we, the, the situation that we are seeing is we have a thriving children's ministry. Um, to where there's children's church up to third, third grade. grade. Okay. And then and everybody else goes to big people church. And then we have youth ministry on Sunday night. Which is sixth grade, right? It starts at sixth grade. And so then we have parents saying, what do you have to offer? Yeah, and, 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 and then the conundrum in a smaller church, especially when you got two, one, two, three, fourth and fifth graders, those parents just always want to say, well, could we just move them into the youth group? Let me tell you, the answer to that should be unequivocally, unequivocal, unequivocal, it should be, the answer to that should be no. <laughs> so all of that to say, um, because moving them up sooner creates more problems later, and it's just not worth it. If we're not addressing the third, fourth, fifth grade conundrum, A. Uh, preteen, preteen pre could be fourth or fifth grade or third, fourth and fifth grade, because third graders are what nine, ten, eight, nine. So they're really still pre-adolescent, but adolescents beginning now around 10 or 11, even physically, bodies have changed that much. Um, so um, third grade is kind of on the cusp of whether you include it in children's ministry or not. Um, they're pre yeah, they're, pre they're, they're born 18 months old. Yeah. Um, one, so um, it's what to do with them, and then us back here, we're going, well, gosh, why are we keeping the children's ministry floating? We're, we're all scrambling as much as we can. How can we start a third age range? It is a conundrum. Now, some churches, your big, larger, giant churches, you'll see a preteen ministry. Um, um, it often is a little token gesture. But I think it's something we're going to have to struggle with to make it a to make space really between children and youth ministry. Brad, what were you going to say? Uh, some churches too, depending on how their middle schools are structured or just the volume, they they've kept sixth graders in the uh, tween ministry also. So the third to six, fourth to six, and so on. So so we do a retreat called the B Retreat that has. Uh, it's for thir third. I was just wearing that shirt yesterday. Thank you, Brad. For third to sixth graders, and uh, and so and then and that retreat is led by the high school and middle school student leadership team. So, so um, not to plug an event, but it was awesome, uh, and I would love to, for you to bring your kids. So, uh, but to plug an event, yeah, it's March uh, in March fifteenth, I think next year. The um, so the conundrum with that is you got to ask yourself what you do with your sixth graders, because there's also something to be said, if your sixth graders are in middle school, then it'd be great if we we're equipping them with the tools we equip other middle schoolers with, um, to hold them back in with elementary and not be equipping them presents a problem as well. I'm a fan of keeping them in the age range where they go to school. And that creates a problem at Murray County. When there's variations. You know, and maybe that answers part of this because you could maybe then bring the fifth graders into middle school ministry and not have to worry quite as much about your third and fourth graders. 
though your fifth, fourth graders should still be getting to check out. And you know, if you want to do some amazing community outreach, start a preteen ministry and be real conscientious about keeping data of who joins it. Hold a preteen lock-in once every quarter, and you're going to get kids from all over the. You know, I mean, pay somebody else to get some college kids to do it for you. Yeah. And you just show up for like breakfast or something. But um, do some lock-ins, keep good data, and you're going to find yourself with a great crop of um, potential families. Um, because preteen kids don't have a social life so much yet, and they love a good lock-in. Um, so do their parents. If they and don't have so to do their parents. You saw the one last stat. Um, in mainline denominations, after confirmation, the attrition, the loss rate is like 67%. I would bet that this is higher even within the last two to three years. This stat is about three years old. But what that means is um, we have to ramp up our rites of passage. Parents are still having their kids come to confirmation. Uh, and <laughs> I just talked to a little church yesterday from Dakotas who said, we've got three kids in our confirmation class, which is good for them. And two of them we haven't seen. One of them we haven't. I've been here for 12 years and I haven't seen. That's what the pastor said. Okay, so let's look at the next thing. Creating a solid discipleship path means you're figuring out, like I said, your church's DNA. What does the church want them to know about their faith, which is head knowledge, feel with their faith? What, what do you want to guard in their hearts and do with their faith is the hands and feet. When they leave as seniors, and remember, this is all in the Google Drive you should all have access to. So you can um, get the PowerPoint from that as well. But you're welcome to take pictures. It's just, it's right there for you. Um, creating a, disi a solid discipleship path means also um, knowing how many Sundays a year do you actually get to teach. If the crux of your Christian education is on Sunday mornings, how many Sundays do you actually have available to you? It's kind of frightening. So if there's 52 Sundays, let's say, let's take away, how many Sundays could we take away that maybe Sunday school? Like, you know, some churches, like in the summertime, Sunday school doesn't mean. Some of you, most of you do. Some of you may not. Yeah. But you take away, let's take, let's take away 10 Sundays for summertime. Yeah. So that would be down to 42. Let's say you know, there's maybe another yeah, there's another maybe 10 Sundays you might not meet for one reason or another. Mother's Day, Easter, Sunday after Christmas. Sunday school Children appreciation. Program. Sunday school. So let's just, um, just to make the numbers even say another 10. So now we're down to 32. And maybe there's another five special Sundays where the Sunday school meets but you do special things like rally day or mission Sunday or whatever. Now you're down in the, in the 20s. When you think about how many times do you actually have those kids in front of you for Christian education, it makes what you teach even more important. Get it? It's just, you know, every year create yourself a spreadsheet in Excel and figure out this is what we want to teach this year because we haven't taught it in a jillion years. Or you ask yourself, how much do we teach on Sunday mornings what do we teach on Sunday mornings versus, you know, Sunday night youth group or Wednesday night youth group? And who's going to teach what? And how often do we have to rotate some things? Like, I, I don't I think it's horrible that we teach the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ every single year. Because it's in the lectionary every single year, too. Which I'm not necessarily a lectionary fan. Let me tell you, I rebelled against it for years until the internet made amazing resources available that are lectionary based. Now I'm a fan of it. Because now I'm not forced into using one curriculum and their ideas, but if I want a lesson on Ananias and Sapphira, I, which is not you know, part of the you know, like Lenten series or whatever, or, or even lectionary every year, um, I can just go Google that and 10 ideas will come up. So to me, I find out, it's, I, to now I find it less restricting. Um, you also have to think about what your teaching calendar is and then ages and stages. And here's where we're going to land for a little bit. Um, you might have a handout that goes along with this. And so look in your handout 
And is it a blank for, I think you should have a blank one, right? Okay, so um, this is probably the thing that for some reason right now I am the most passionate about. If you did nothing else in your discipleship path, Christian formation planning, you as a church team, you and others that may not even be here today, if you worked on this, I would give you all an A plus and a million and a half points each. Here's why I'm so passionate about this. Ages and stages, rites of passage, memory milestones, memory makers, developmental milestones are all celebratory in nature. And we do have still moms and dads who appreciate when the church celebrates certain things in the lives of their children. This is why we're still seeing mom and dads whose kids haven't come to Sunday school or youth group in years, we're still seeing them take their kids through confirmation. We as teachers are still experiencing the joy of kids who are forced to be in uh, confirmation. Because there is nothing like a petulant teenager being forced to come to a boring class. So the answer to that, don't let your class be boring. Anyway, um, we'll talk about this afternoon. So, if millennials uh, as parents are only connected one time a month, let's give them more of a reason to actually want to connect. What if we celebrated with them more often? Now, it would, it would cure and cultivate a myriad of things. First of all, who doesn't love a party or a celebration? Um, uh, and think of this in celebrating things. You're not only getting the millennial kid, which is actually a Generation Z kid, you're, and the millennial parents and some young Gen Xers. You're not only connecting to them, but you're giving parents some reasons to want to connect. So here's what this Ages and Stages chart looks like. You can see it right here. Um, this was actually one church's. I would push them to fill out that top row, uh, same with you, a little bit more. But if you think about it, um, we do baptism. Many of us do like second or third grade Bible Sunday, because that's kind of a you know, good old Methodist thing. We do that Bible study, Bible Sunday. Um, we still do confirmation, because pastors are charged with that. And most of us do some kind of graduate from high school celebration, otherwise known as, who's that kid? Because um, we haven't seen him in so long. Well, when we give them more milestones to celebrate, we do see them more often, and it equips them, and we celebrate, and then we're given, when we do these celebrations, my 82-year-old mom, a reason to go and talk with that kid and have some form of connection. So I'll give you, um, also you'll see in the second row, the first row is about all the developed milestones of a teenager, a child or a teenager. The second row is the kicker. This is the brilliant one. If you think about it, if you want to provide and meet the needs for millennial parents, then understand they feel less equipped to talk about things of faith with their children than any generation yet. You know why that is? are less equipped because there's less and less that do know the stories um, and they don't trust themselves to just instinctively give it over to God you know just instinctively pray God doesn't care about how poetic it is just pray and and he hears it um, so if we put a com parent component we're not only celebrating the child we're equipping mom and dad um, let's see uh, anybody any of you Possess a. Um, I didn't say your child was possessed, but if you, anybody, any of you possess an eighth grader or a high school grad in your household this year? Both. Okay. So now this is not Christine's first high school grad graduation because you have the year old. Wait. Okay. One hand. The yeah. The so imagine this was her first child. And the first time her child was graduating eighth grade, going into high school, she had been a high school parent. 
Um, as a parent of seven kids, I was scared to death the first couple of years. I stopped caring after that. Um, I figured they could learn. That's what the older ones were for. That's what, it's what when you have multiple spare ones, the older ones tell the younger one what how to get to their locker, and it's all good. But when we have when we meet the need of parents, those of you that have sent kids off to college, you were probably more nervous. I remember that journey. We were more scared and nervous and weepy than our kid was. Chandra hadn't sent a kid off to college before. What if the church helped meet that need? What if you were holding a class that said, hey, join us for an hour and a half of tips of how to send your kid off to college? And you advertised it in the community. Wouldn't it be cool if you were the place that did that? Um, here are other rites of passage. We were talking about prom over here. Um, this is prom season. What if the church started celebrating, because we're a church family, right? Each one of us has our family. What if the families that happens to be in church started celebrating some of these pivotal moments? Um, I was at a church last week, Second Pres in Bloomington, Illinois. Big, giant church. Lots of problems. Oh, my gosh. They're the crankiest church I think I've ever been in. Not been in a lot of churches. They are cranky. I was exhausted when I left them. And you don't have to go run and tell them they're cranky, because I already did. And I used the word cranky. As I said, y'all know you're a little cranky, right? You know, there's politics going on here, and they all went, what? Well, yes, that's why we were there. So, but they did the coolest thing last weekend. It was Bloomington High School prom. So the youth group, they've got a solid high school ministry of kids who just adore each other and stay connected. So the church, the youth ministry, set up photo booths in the church, around the church. They had a lot of great spots for that. And all the high school kids with their dates came and had their pictures taken at 5 o'clock in the different photo settings. It was not hard to do. It, he said this was not hard to set up because they had many spots. They had several spots that already lent themselves to that. The kids started out at the church, then went off to prom, and, and, and he said the best thing I did was just take pictures with all their iPhones. Because, you know, you got 5, 6, 10, 12 iPhones, and somebody's got to actually be there to do all of that. And so wouldn't it be cool? What if, you know, what if we got involved with prom that way? You have to make it, you do the math to make it work at your church. Another small little church in the Dakotas Conference had prom two weeks ago. They are the kind of prom that meets in the high school gym, and it's a real small rural town. There's, there's not a lot of restaurants to go to. So the church held the pre-prom dinner. And even though the church only had two seniors, um, and one of them, I don't think went to prom, but... Um, the church had a fellowship hall full of couples come and do prom dinner at the church. Now, and then we take pictures and then we celebrate them. Then we, um, here's the other key thing. Not only do we want to meet the needs of a child or a teenager, we, and not only do we want to meet the needs of parents in these celebratory moments, we need to give our church members more quote unquote touch points. When we do rites of passage, we miss it's a missed opportunity if we just have church members sit back and watch it happen. Because let's make confirmation bigger and better. And it doesn't have to be harder and better, bigger and better by involving the congregation. How do we do that? Um, somebody mentioned they're doing sponsors. Okay, so those number of members are involved. How do we get the general church at large? Now, you're not going to get everybody because you've got some cranky, and lazy pants in your church, too. And that's an official word. Look it up. Cranky, lazy pants. <laughs> um, but they're sure as heck aren't going to get connected if you don't offer them any opportunity to get it connected. So what if at the beginning of the confirmation season, you had the confirmation kids go up and say, and you say to your church, okay, all of you that our last names begin with A through F, I want you to pray for Billy here. All of you whose names are G through M, you pray for Susan. All of you that are the rest of the alphabet and the rest of the kids, what if you, and, and you have them pray for that, for that child. And so, so what you're thinking is, yeah, they're going to say yes or nod their head. 
and they're just going to walk away and forget. Well, don't let them walk away and forget. You know, make sheets of paper available with that teenager's bio info on it or something, or testimony on it. I know that sounds a little bit like creepy, but... Um, uh, or I think that teenager's contact information. Or what if you made a little mailbox system available or just envelopes on a wall where people could write notes and drop it into the envelopes of the kids to encourage them along the way. Um, at you know, anything that gets the church involved in the rite of passage also then provides, like I said before, um, have I, I don't know if I've shared this idea with you, um, I say it so much that I forget where I said. If I have already told you, just pretend like I haven't talked about it. And I've, you know, been on a lot of morphine since then. I'm not on morphine now, by the way. Um, that was I got off that quick. That stuff does kill the pain, but it makes you have weird dreams, like you're in Hawaii with Jesus. Um, so um, there's this church that we did an assessment at, and they're the kind of church that does scrolling announce. They have screens. And they do their announcements scrolling on a screen before church. Um, so their habit, one of the rites of passage they celebrate is whenever a child loses their first tooth, they just go back to the sound booth guy who takes a quick picture on his phone. It takes about 10 seconds to take the picture, type in his name, and put that in the opening scrolling loop you know, of announcements. Johnny lost his first tooth. There's this big mug smiling with his tooth lost. And then, and it doesn't cost anything. It doesn't take any time in the service, but it gave every single person a reason to go to Johnny and connect with him. Now, some of you, how do you do that if you don't, if you don't have screens in your church with announcements? You know, you think of a different way. Um, you know, maybe uh, maybe that means he, he you still take his picture and it goes up on a board or you or I mean pastors. I bet you there's one or two things you could cut out of your sermon for us to have two minutes to celebrate something in a life of a child. I know I'm stepping on toes here. Oh no. Yeah. I, I am. I, I, I'm with you, sister. You got good ten minutes after. You got a good ten minutes out of me, and then after that, I'm just got my polite Christian, Southern Christian woman face on, which looks a little bit like that resting duck face. But uh, I'm just thinking about what I'm going to do that afternoon after about ten minutes. So, um, so you see what I mean? That there's so many things we could celebrate. Um, any of you going to give out, like in your confirmation class, you're going to give out Bibles or anything like that? You don't believe in the Bible? No, they already have Bibles. So we're going to give them Great. Um, the Bible I use, no, I won't work with my great Bible idea, but okay, whatever. Thanks for ruining it. Okay, so I went, I met this church. I heard about this church. It was on one of my coaching calls in another cohort where they said, oh, you know, we got the Bible thing covered. We give Bibles out at three years old, third grade, confirmation, and graduation. I said, you give them four Bibles? That's a lot of Bibles. They said, yeah, but each one of them is different. And I went, oh my gosh, I never thought of that before. Because the three-year-old Bible is really just going to be a picture Bible. The third grade Bible Sunday is kind of a child's Bible. And if, oh, I'm just going to say this, please don't be giving them those boring RSV award Bibles that you get for 564 from Christian book distributors. That No kids read that. I just want to tell you, it's nice for you, but it isn't for them. So just give them a Bible they can read. So at confirmation, give them a teenage Bible. Give them group's youth Bible or the Jesus-centered Bible or whatever student teenager version actually will say something to them. And then at graduation, give them a grown-up Bible, because they don't want to be seen with their children's Bible or their teenage Bible in college. Give them then a good NIV study Bible or whatever. But don't give them those boring ones that don't say anything. I mean, they, say, they have the word God in it, but... Yeah, wow. Boy, Jesus, I didn't mean you. You know what I meant. Leave them Okay, I'll talk to God about it later. He knew what I meant. So, I put this on my Facebook. Any of you that are my Facebook friends saw this. I saw this the best thing ever. It's a table like this. And go back in my, um, just go back like two days in my Facebook feed. 
there was a table like this, and he put a picture there. It actually was a little video. It was from my friend Mike Kupfer in uh, Ohio, Indiana, somewhere. Um, and it was it was the seniors' Bibles, and they had each it had a tag by each Bible, and the what well, the post on Facebook was a little instruction video. It was only about two minutes long. He just videotaped it and they gave the instructions. But what church members would do is these Bibles were set up for two weeks and there was post-it notes and cards and stuff right there and church members were just supposed to go and write little post-it notes with an encouragement note and, and or the reason why this was their favorite scripture and stick them in each one of the Bibles. It's something you could do at home too and then bring them in. But the idea being is that in two weeks when they celebrate those grads, those grads are going to get this Bible that people have actually poured into. Do you know what I'm saying? Now, if, I don't know about you, but my, I don't know how much Bible reading I did my first year of college. I did a lot of menu reading, but anyway, that's a whole other story, and I've been forgiven <laughs> since then. But um, if I were going to take a Bible and use it to college, one at college, one that people have poured over like that is likely to be something I would grab again. If Miss Cheryl has written in it, you know, or Miss or Pastor Christine has written in it, I'm going to read that. And one of the things we know is that the Word of God never goes forth void. So as much as we can get our kids inside that, I just thought that was the greatest right. I just thought that was the greatest right passage ever. So. Um, what, have, uh, what happens at 11.30, by the way, Brad? Or what's the next thing? Is that you, I think? Um, we can go longer if we need to. I'm just going to go just a couple of minutes. Just keep on going. And, and then Here are some run. ideas for the next passage. Um, you could do something when they have a pet loss. I don't know what that would be. Maybe it's a place where they can come see you, their pastor, or you, their leader, and go over to a special little corner in the church. This is going to sound real Roman Catholic, what I'm about to say, but anyway, go with it. Think of a better idea. Maybe light a special candle and leave their pet's picture for the day. Something that recognizes that child's going through the grieving loss, because it's the first time they experience grief is usually a pet before it's a grandparent. And they do have sympathy for us. And yes. And I think sympathy caught, I know I lost my precious Lexi, um, I've, I've never had a dog, and I adore, I do love that dog more than my kids. They're right. Um, what if you celebrated first tooth? Um, backpacks. Every, all of our kids are hopefully are going back to school. This, you know, unless they're, you know, I don't know. Unless you've got some different situations. Um, but even homeschool kids use backpacks. So we're all doing some kind of promotion rally or rally Sunday or whatever. My charge to us is, instead of just doing it in Sunday school, do something with the congregation. Have students bring their backpacks. Have congregation members pray over them. Have congregation members, A through F again, bring a set of pencils and one certain set bring paper and certain set bring crayons, whatever. Figure out the math of all of that. What if um, this other church I know creates a backpack tag every year and it's become the cool thing to collect the latest backpack tag and they've been doing it for five or six years now and so they got some kids who are well into high school still carrying that backpack tag and so you're taking a memory of your church family with you every day. Um, what if you just celebrated driver's license? Um, and, you know, that's another quick picture you can put in the opening loop of something. I have a pastor friend that's in Evansville, first president in Evansville. They don't have screens in their sanctuary, um, which he would love to have screens in their sanctuary, but they don't. So instead, when you get your driver's license, you come up for about a minute or so, he just sprinkles he dips his hand in the baptismal font and kind of sprinkles it over the driver's license in the student's hand and raise, you know, a little blessing in the name of his baptismal covenant or her baptismal covenant. Um, that kind of thing. Everybody sort of get where I'm going with that? I am going to um, show you one last video clip. And um, either um, you, you can talk about, I don't know, if, do we have a lunchtime? Do we have homework to do at lunchtime? Uh, We'll talk about, they're ready to eat lunch. Okay, so. we're not quite ready yet. Just okay. a little bit. It's just now 1130. But, um, 
So when you get a break, whether it's today or whether it's on the drive home or whether uh, coaches, let's make this a bit of homework. When you talk to your teams in May, get from them that they have all set a date to talk about rites of passage and that empty chart everybody has. Okay? Y'all got that as a handout. It's also going to be in your Google Drive so you can print down umpteen copies, whatever. Um, and this is not all of your discipleship path, but it's some of it. And so make their homework the fact, not so much that they've done the chart, but at least that they've set a date to talk about the chart. Does that make sense? Because what would be cool is if you all worked on it before the end of the school year so that you could maybe put some of the plans in place for next year. And here's what you're thinking. You may be thinking, great, Stephanie just added five or six more events to our calendar. That's not what I'm saying. Get your youth and children's key stakeholders together to plan the rites of passage or the developmental celebrations. But let me tell you, if you plan them, you'll have a much easier time being able to recruit one or two people to lead individual ones. Because you've planned it, but it's, it's really easy to get you know, your soccer mom types to plan a little celebration or to plan how you're going to do a Bible Sunday table with that Bible idea. Or um, a, a, a few of your, if you have any, um, you have high school parents, freshmen, sophomore, juniors, always planning that, that your senior grad Sunday. That, so that kind of perpetuates itself. Um, and they want to plan because they want to make sure that their kids, when their kids are seniors have somebody that's planning it. So I bet it's always been an easy yes for me to get the younger grades to plan the grad Sunday. So you don't all have to do it. You're just telling them what you want. Makes it much easier. Okay, so I told you I was going to leave you with more questions in how do you plan your teaching plan, your scope and sequence, your no feel do's, even just your ages and stages. But here's why it's important. Um, taking the time to be, to meet the specific needs of your kids, um, to recognize who your kids are. Don't be afraid by the large group of kids. You only have to worry about the 10 or 12 or however many you have in your setting. Um, it's worth it to think about your kids their de de developmental needs, your setting, and to make a specific plan. This is a video that I got off of YouTube, so it's not the highest quality. Um, let me set it up. This is a, the picture you see is, a, is this girl's younger sister. The main girl in the, in the, in the video has um, a, uh, she, she has a special life. Okay, she's had surgery and has a special prosthetic leg, and this is what happened. You'll be able to hear better in a minute.
the volume that I had it sent off to this company is set by press headaches. And so they said after she arrived, they um, she was given a room to stay while her new leg was being made. She was fitted with a leg and her finger color pink and started walking on her right away. After a few weeks of training to walk and run in her new prosthetic, she is ready to go home and live her life without limitation of beauty. Thank you. Tell them Thank you. Thank you for making this all like me. <laughs> I'm not trying. I'm not trying. Gets me every damn time. Um, here's this girl just in today's world needing to know she's loved and opportunities to love. And this company takes American Girl dolls and made a doll like her. And I think we're called to do that in each one of our churches. Um, if, it was, if it was the big C church and only that specific, then we'd be all doing the same thing. And gosh, we can hardly agree on doing the same things in our churches of 100 people, much less 100,000 people. Um, so specific, specificity matters, I think. Um, um, gearing towards the individual need matters. Going the extra effort matters. Because um, don't you love the younger sister? She's excited about celebrating. Teach our kids in our churches how to celebrate with each other. They're excited. And, and that little sister didn't mind that it was about the big sister. The big sister getting a gift. And so I hope we'd be raising a congregation that wouldn't mind. I don't care. I just like to have a party. I don't care who we're celebrating. You know, and I think most of our churches, that's true. That's why Confirmation Sunday is so cool. And do you have some cranky pants people who don't want to celebrate? Maybe you do, but, you know. Well, I better not say anything because I can edit myself. All right, friends. Brad, you're up next, I think. Come on, come on up. It, it reminded me of my, uh, several of you are friends with me on Facebook, but uh, my cousin, who was a pastor uh, and performed Shelly and I's wedding, his granddaughter uh, was injured in an accident uh, four years ago when she was five, four or five. And uh, she lost part, lost her leg, and um, and so now four years later, she's competing in the Endeavor Games, and she's uh, uh, Hanger Prosthetics is this company that makes uh, prosthetics for athletes and people that need them and so on. So she's been their sort of their poster child athlete. There, if you look at my Facebook page, you'll see that. But that's that's awesome. That, that we think about how do we help people feel. Um, uh, special and normal, you know, and, and loved and so on. So, um, we're going to have lunch here soon, but before we do that, my friend Alec Lister from Mountaintop, is that right? I see, last, I see that man, I'm on it today. Yeah, you but got it. Alex Lister from Mountaintop um, wanted to come and share with you about a uh, special week they do at Mountaintop. Uh, Mountaintop is a uh, mission and ministry uh, organization up in Grundy County up near Bershiva Springs Assembly, actually. Instead of taking a left and going to Bershiva, you take a right and you go over to Cumberland Pines. And and uh, I've participated there with youth groups and then also have been up there several times. We've got places for retreat centers and things like that. So I've asked Alex to come. He wants to share about a, um, a week that they have coming up that you guys might be able to participate in. Yeah. I'll use that. <laughs> Well, I see a few familiar faces here. Like I said, or like Brad said, my name is Alex from Mount Top. How many of you guys have like heard of Mount Top, familiar with our programming before? Wonderful, so I'm kind of appreciative the part on this one. I won't take too much time. I see the lunch is out. I know we're probably all really hungry, so I'll be concise and be straight to the point. Um, but at Mount Top, we have a lot of different volunteer opportunities with a lot of different people that come through our camp. We work with middle schoolers, high schoolers, college students, young adults, senior adults, families. I say my volunteers pretty much go from diapers to diapers. Um, yeah, we've got a program for you if you want to come on up. Um, but I want to specifically talk to you all about our neighborhood.
Neighbors Helping Neighbors program. Now, in the summertime, that's our biggest season. We have a lot of high school students that come from across the country. We're going to have about 1,300, 1,400 different students that are going to come down and serve with us. But our Neighbors Helping Neighbors program is something that's a little bit different. It's the same exact type of service. So you're doing the same projects. You have the same worship, same staff. But we've tailored it to smaller churches because we understand that smaller churches have unique challenges, right? Sometimes you can't always have a huge staff, so a lot of your people are volunteer-based, right? And your volunteers can't give 150% of their time and effort to some of their goals. We completely understand that. We also understand that your budgets might not be as big as you would like them to be, so we tailor our prices accordingly. We want you guys to have the same exact experience, the same exact service that every other church has, and so that's what our Neighbors Helping Neighbors program has. When I'm finished talking, I'll pass out my registration forms that have a lot more information. But Neighbors Helping Neighbors runs this year from July 3rd to July 7th. So you'd arrive on Tuesday, you would leave on Saturday, and you have three days of work out in the community. And like I said, it's just like every other mountaintop program you've heard of. So your students would come in, they're going to be doing porches, wheelchair ramps, sheds, painting, yard work, whole nine yards. Right? We take care of everybody, you stay in camp with us, we feed you three square meals a day, you have evening worships, and the staff is led, you have morning devotionals that's led by the staff. Pretty much when you come to camp, this is kind of your vacation. We're going to handle all the planning and all the logistics and all the problems. You just got to get your students there and have to make sure they're having a good time. Um, so we would love to have you guys. I've got my phone number. I've got my email on there as well. If you're interested in our Neighbors Helping Neighbors program, we still have availability this year. So if you're still looking for a mission trip for your youth, we would love to have you. And there's no minimum number. We have to follow safe sanctuary guidelines, so we'll need to have at least one adult for every five kids. And then obviously we'll need a vehicle that has seatbelts. Um, but outside of that, even if you have three youth that want to come and there's one adult, wonderful. We'd love to have you. So with our Neighbors Helping Neighbors program, we're a little bit more flexible with the minimum age. So let's say that you have a 10 or 11 year old that's a younger brother or a younger sister and you don't want to leave them out because your youth group's only made of eight people. That's completely fine. I don't want to leave them out either. That seems like kind of counterintuitive to leave part of your youth group at home. We recommend that everybody's at least entering the seventh grade or 13 years of age. That just makes our programming a little bit more concise, projects a little bit more concise. But like I said, if there's just one kid or two kids in your youth group that are a little bit younger that you don't want to leave out, I don't want to leave them out either. Bring them on in. They're going to have a great experience. They're going to serve. They're going to see the Lord. They're going to change some lives. Um, what, is, what is the typical day so you'll wake up about 7-ish, 7, 7.30. We have breakfast every morning. After breakfast, we'll have a written devotional that'll be given to all the campers. After that, you'll have a meeting with your project coordinator and your work team, um, and you'll go out, we like to say, out by 9, feeling fine at Mountaintop. So we try to get you on the work site from 9 to 5. Projects all kind of just depend on what we have available and what the needs are in the community. Um, but we're never going to throw you into something that you're completely underprepared for. Um, all of the projects are minor home repair, which means they do not affect structural integrity of the house. So it'll be a wheelchair ramp or a porch or a shed, maybe doing some painting on the exterior or interior of a house, maybe it's yard work, just really all depends on the family, the skills that we have um, in camp. You'll have a midday devotion as well as a, and a cooler lunch. It's, led by the staff. After that, you'll return. We'll have dinner at 6 o'clock. After dinner, you'll have like some free time, maybe some community games or two. We'll have a point in discussion, which we call sharing, which is either in a big group or a small group. And that's what we really get into the nitty gritty of how we, of, of connecting the how of service and the what of service to the why of service. So how did you see the Lord today? How is he your source? How did he provide for you? How did you see hope get instilled into folks? Why did you push your faith into action? After that, we'll then have worship led by the staff. Worship is, we try to mix it up so it's not always just somebody standing on a podium talking to you night. It might be a station's worship. It might be a prayer worship. It might be um, a worship that the campers themselves end up helping us put together. So worships all, again, depend on um, the flow of the day of the week. After that, we'll have free time, bed prep, and then go to bed, typically around 10 o'clock, and then the cycle repeats. Saturday's a little bit different, obviously. That's when you leave. You still have breakfast with us in the morning. We still have a written devotional. We'll do some cleanup in camp, and we try to get everybody out of the gate by 9 a.m. So that's kind of like your typical daily flow of what you experience um, at Mount Top with our neighbors helping them through it. We like to have um, seven seat belts per vehicle. The reason why we ask seven seat belts per vehicle is because that's about the size of your work team. Um, it's a lot easier if there's only one vehicle going out to every single work site. 
um, just because there's less vehicles in the driveway, less vehicles on the road, easier to make sure you have head counts and no one gets left in like a dollar general when you're going to the bathroom. Um, so seven vehicles is preferable, or seven seatbelts per vehicle is preferable. Let's say that just something happens where like there's just absolutely no way, there's no rental car place, there's nowhere in the church you can borrow one, church doesn't have a van, we can work with you. Like I said, I don't want to be a barrier to Christ and I don't want seatbelts to be a barrier to Christ either. We'll make it happen. If you guys want to be in camp, I want you to be in camp and I'd love to make it happen. Our neighbors helping neighbors program, we cap that $150 a participant. Oh my gosh. Um, oh, one more thing. We also, if you're a senior pastor, you're coming for free. If you're the youth pastor, you're oh coming for free. Oh my gosh, then you, you can't do it for a hundred. <laughs> you just can't do it because they're going to get the supplies, they're going to get the permits. Oh, you can't do it for a hundred. Don't try to do it yourselves. You can take that. Yep, so we're taking care of all the projects, we're taking care of all the materials. If there's specialty tools, we're going to have that. We just ask you guys to bring kind of basic tools like hammers, gloves, eyeglasses, just stuff that's easier for you all to find seven pairs of than us to find 700 pairs of. Exactly, exactly. Uh, but yeah, a lot of the big time tools, like we're taking care of that. So I'm going to pass out all of my, my form and my business card. Call me, email me. If you have any questions at all, I'd love to get back to you as soon as I can. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. Um, so I, uh, I, one of the, I think it was one of the first times I went, I, um, I asked this lady named Kathy to go with us, and Kathy was, told me she was too old and her kids had graduated, and so she didn't have time, to, she, didn't, she had done her time, and so I convinced her to go, and she became the, the hero of the story that's been told for generations, uh, because they were, she was on a team, and they were out at this site, and um, they were moving some, some a pile of rocks so that they could build a ramp, I think is what it was. And um, all the kids were out in the front, and all of a sudden this lady that lived in the house that had some different challenges and so on came running out after them, and she had a big rock above, and she was holding it above her head, like, and she was screaming, like, ah, running at it, you know, with this big rock, like she was going to bash their heads in and so on. And Kathy was facing the other direction and she heard this woman screaming with this rock above her head and Kathy turned around and said, in the name of Jesus, put down that rock. And they said the lady froze, brought the rock down from over her head and stared at it and laid it down and just silently turned and walked away. And so uh, Kathy became like, I mean, this is crazy, uh, serious stuff that these kids now, that was like 10, 12 years, 10 years ago, that they're still talking. Like when they see Kathy at church, they're like, yes, Kathy. She became a rock star. <laughs> so, you know, so find some Kathy or, if, you know, find that person. And, uh, you know, it's, um, I think the, uh, I think the reality is, um, when you take kids and, and adults together on trips, you have the opportunity to have